All right, welcome back everybody. So today we are starting a new unit. This unit is uh, sort of two weeks. The first week we're going to be talking about the Protestant Reformation. And then uh, next week we're going to be talking about the Council of Trent, uh, which is one of many ways that the Catholic Church responded to the Protestant Reformation. So we are skipping about a thousand years of history. And in, in last video I talked about why we're doing so little on the medieval period. Uh, so I don't want to repeat myself on that. Um, so we're jumping from, remember, uh, St. Benedict and the rule of Benedict and, and, and uh, St. Gregory uh, all the way to the early 16th century. So quite a jump. What I want to do in this video is uh, several things. First of all, talk about mostly Martin Luther. He's the sort of godfather of the Reformation, if you will. Uh, and talk about his life, talk about some of his fundamental thought. Um, it's difficult to talk about Protestants in general because uh, certainly Protestants have many similar beliefs that they hold, but they also believe in a lot of different things. And uh, it's impossible in, in, a, in a course like this to talk about all of the differences among Protestants. So if there's a fundamental difference between Protestants in this lecture, I'll try to point that out the different ways that maybe different Protestants think about a particular issue. For example, one of the biggest ones is the Eucharist. How do, uh, uh, what, what they would often just call the communion, for example. Uh, Protestants think quite differently about that among themselves, and they certainly disagree with Catholics on that. Um, uh, so in order to sort of narrow our discussion, uh, we, we're going to focus on, on Martin Luther uh, because he is the sort of godfather. And there's sort of different motivations for the different strands of, of uh the Reformation. Uh, so, for example, Luther, to his credit, was sort of motivated by um, by finding the truth, what he what he thought was the truth. Whereas someone like Henry VIII, who started the English Reformation, at least at the beginning, uh, had nothing to do with theology. In fact, he uh, little little known little known fact people often forget is that he initially against Luther. Uh, had written a theological treatise. Even though he was a king, he was actually fairly well um, theologically educated for an amateur, and he was given the title Defender of the Faith uh, by the Pope. Um, of course, then, and we don't have time to get into this, he, the Church of England, breaks off because he's motivated not by theology, uh, but because he wants to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon, who was the daughter of uh, the, the, the uh, king and queen of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, because Luther thought that he, um, as there was conventional thinking at the time, sorry, not Luther, Henry VIII, um, the conventional thinking was um, the reason he could not have a male heir uh, was her fault, right? Of course, they didn't fully understand biology and, and procreation at that point. So uh, Henry VIII wasn't motivated by theology. So we're going to focus on Luther. We're going to talk about his thought, his life, and uh, some fundamental principles of uh, Protestant thought. And then next week, we're really going to, to go a little bit more deeply, not only in the Council of Trent, but what the Council of Trent was responding to. So by the end of the week, you should have a very clear understanding of what are the fundamental differences between Protestantism and Catholicism. Now, why are we doing this? This is a Catholic uh, seminary. We are a Master's of Arts in Pastoral Ministry program. What's the point of this exercise? Uh, as as pastoral ministers, you are going to uh, engage with certainly people uh, outside of the church, uh, because we live at least historically in, in uh, uh, until the past hundred years or so, a country that was not predominantly Catholic. Um, so there's a lot of Protestants around. So just engaging with them uh, and evangelizing them. Uh, speaking to them about the Catholic truths, you, you need to know something about them. More specifically, in a pastoral context for your for your work, uh, it's very likely that if you're running an RCIA program, for example, or maybe you're in a campus ministry, you're going to encounter Protestants uh, who are interested in possibly becoming Catholic. And so they're going to go through your RCIA program, and you need to be able to speak intelligently uh, a, a, about where they're coming from. You need to know where they're coming from. You need to know what are the sort of fundamental questions, what are the assumptions that they have that are different from the assumptions that we Catholics have, so that when you're 
uh, in that RCA program you're running that you can speak to their needs and their desires. So this is not, uh, again, this is not some sort of abstract intellectual ex exercise just for the sake of knowing history, although there's nothing wrong with just knowing history. Uh, but this does have a very real practical pastoral implication, especially in the United States and especially here in Southern California, where uh, you know, there we, we have the very definition of religious pluralism, right? Any any Protestant group that you can think of is going to be in Southern California. Okay, so that's what uh, we're going to do today. First, uh, uh, just a brief word about this idea of reformation. Uh, we often just say that word without thinking too much about it, but I think that word is instructive. What is it that the Protestant reformers want to do? They want to reform. Right. In other words, they don't want to. And in, in their minds, they think they're not introducing anything new. So when Luther says X, Y and Z is true in his mind, he's not saying something new that's true, but he wants to get back to in his mind to the early church because he and other Protestant reformers believe that the Catholic Church sort of uh, over time, especially when you get into that medieval period, took a wrong turn. Uh, and and became corrupt and not just uh, morally corrupt um, but but doctrinally corrupt so you're going to see in the readings for this week uh, for example Luther calls the Catholic Church uh, a lot of things he slanders in a lot of ways he calls it the whore of Babylon but one of the titles he gives it is the the Aristotelian Church and by what he means by that is because the Catholic Church uh, did and, and does use uh, Aristotelian philosophical vocabulary, that is vocabulary taken from the pre-Christian Greek philosopher Aristotle to, to for a variety of reasons, but most importantly probably to describe the Eucharist, that language of transubstantiation, uh, which we may have time to talk about uh, uh, in our discussion, but certainly in your sacramental theology classes, you'll be talking about that substance and accidents and that we, we, we can describe the, the change in the bread and the, and the wine into the body and blood, soul and divinity as uh, the change in the, the substance changes, but the accidents remain. Again, you'll get into that in your sacramental theology class. I don't want to go on a tangent here, but that vocabulary comes from a pre-Christian Greek philosopher named Aristotle. So Luther looks at the Catholic Church in this example and says the Catholic Church has been corrupted. What we need to do is get back to the, the truths of the early church. So all the Protestant reformers, that's what they wanted to do. And, and the reason why they said that nothing, that, that they're not presenting anything new that's true is because theologically speaking, anything that's new were, uh, immediately sus is, is immediately suspect. Just think of, for example, the truth of 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? 2 plus 2 equals 4 was true yesterday. It's true today, and it's going to be true tomorrow. And if it's not true tomorrow, then we should fundamentally question whether or not it's a true statement at all, because anything that's sort of capital T truth, true is going to be true uh, uh, no matter what culture you're in, no matter what time you're in, no matter what language you speak. And that's especially true for theological truths, because theological truths are not constructed based on culture or traditions, small t traditions. They're grounded in, in, in God's truths, God's revelation, uh, and God himself is timeless. God doesn't change, and so his truths don't change. So the Protestants look at Catholics and say, ah, it's you Catholics, you've changed. You have changed over this 1,500-year period so that now when you get to the early 16th century, you Catholics are teaching something that wasn't being taught in the early church. So we Protestants need to get back to that early church, those, those early church teachings. Um, so that's what we mean by reformation. They want to reform, okay? All right, so that's a sort of general claim. Now let's sort of get into uh, a bit about Martin Luther. Martin Luther is a, is a fascinating character personally, sort of, sort of like Augustine. He had a sort of how should we put it, uh, a, a sort of tumultuous life, at least at the beginning, uh, sort of stuff that the, um, 
that uh, soap operas are made out of. In fact, the Reformation itself is one giant soap opera, and I'm not just saying that. There was a show uh, called The Tudors about 10, 15 years ago on, uh, I think it was Showtime, that was uh, of, of the life of Henry VIII, and it and basically is a soap opera. Uh, and Martin Luther sort of had some of those qualities uh, to his life as well. He was born in 1483 uh, to a sort of humble beginnings. Uh, his father uh, was a, a domineering figure, in his life, and and I think people often overly psycho- psychologize Luther and you know his sort of problematic relationship with his father, uh, sort of translated into a sort of problematic relationship with God. Early in God, uh, Luther's life, uh, he he sort of had this sort of fire and brimstone. God is angry all the time. Uh, Luther is sort of known once he later became a monk uh, to sort of like go to confession all the time and even confess things like, uh, you know, passing gas, which is just something our bodies do. But he thought that was a sin. And so he would confess it. Uh, So he had this sort of vision of a domineering God. You know, I don't want to completely discredit the idea of psychology and and, and that, that how we think about our, our biological fathers or maybe our stepfathers does, in fact, influence the way that we think about God. Um, and we see that today in the 21st century when you have absentee fathers, uh, the way that that shapes how people think about um, uh, God, our father. At the same time, we need to be careful about not over psychologizing this because Luther did have sort of theological uh, problems. As I mentioned earlier, uh, his theological problems with the Catholic Church, uh, we can take seriously in the sense that we we can appreciate that he was searching for truth. He also did, um, uh, later on when he became a monk, uh, was sort of disgusted by the uh, immorality that he saw around him specifically when he went from germany he took a he took a pilgrimage to rome and he saw really a moral bankruptcy happening in rome uh, he was not the first person to see this he was not the last person to see this there was for example uh, prostitution houses that were dedicated just to priests right so you couldn't go there for their services unless you were a priest um now there's nothing new in that sense that that from the beginning there's always a the, the phrase is ecclesia semper reformanda that the church is always reforming morally speaking um so that luther called out the church for sort of moral corruption I mean, is not wrong but we also have to recognize he's not doing anything different there the, throughout the med- medieval period there were lots of people who called the church out for that but what Luther and the other reformers did was that they were calling for th- theological uh, reform as well. So Luther had this sort of domineering father uh, who wanted him to become a, a, a Luther, to become a lawyer. Uh, and, and Luther went, ended up going to study at the University of Erfurt. Uh, but he ended up making his father quite angry by dropping out of law school. Because he, Luther got caught in a thunderstorm, and this is kind of a, a dramatic moment in the history of Christianity, similar to Luther's sort of conversion, uh, sorry, uh, Augustine's moment in the garden. Luther is stuck in a thunderstorm. He was very, his entire life, very afraid of lightning and thunder. And he prayed uh, uh, that if he were to to make it out of this thunderstorm alive, that he would become a monk. And he did make it out alive, so he followed up on his promise, and he did become a monk, specifically an an Augustinian. And I think that's important to to know that. So we talked about Augustine. One thing that we really didn't talk about is that there is an order of St. Augustine, OSA. So just like there are Franciscans and Benedictines and Jesuits and all those groups, there is an order, the order of St. Augustine. And Luther was an Augustinian. So when he joined the order, he studied uh, uh, Augustine and became deeply influenced by Augustine. Uh, and all the, inf- uh, the, 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 the reformers were influenced by Augustine. doesn't necessarily mean they liked everything Augustine wrote or said. But, for example, um, Luther couldn't stand Thomas Aquinas and completely rejected him in the medieval scholastics. But he did like his entire life. He did like um, uh, Augustine. 
So, Gus, uh, so Luther became an Augustinian monk, uh, and he goes on to the University of Wittenberg, which was kind of an upstart school at that point. There were other schools that had been around for hundreds of years. Think of Oxford, uh, for example. Um, but um, Wittenberg was kind of an upstart school at this point. He go, uh, Luther goes to Wittenberg, uh, sort of becomes a, what we would call a, a doctor and a professor uh, of, of, the, of the University of Wittenberg. And it's while he's already there that he, from 1513 to about 1518, uh, he goes in a deep study of, of the letters of Paul. Now, that might sound surprising that uh, Luther hadn't really studied Paul up until that point. But think back to what I've said in previous videos, that this is a time period where you have very low literacy rate. You can't just walk down to the, to the bookstore and buy a Bible and sort of flipping through um, you know, the New Testament and reading whatever you want, that most people didn't own their own Bibles. Uh, and um, you know, the Bibles would be chained in, uh, in the monasteries, would be chained to the desks so they couldn't be taken or stolen. So having access to the Bible, to being able to read the Bible. Uh, this is something that was really uh, ultimately reserved for few people. So Luther then gets into a, this deep study of Luther, uh, sorry, of Paul, and then again he had studied Augustine. And this is where his, his theology starts to, uh, starts to change and leads to um, uh, the, the, the rumblings of the, of the Reformation. The standard date that's usually offered for the beginning of the Reformation is October 31st, 1517, which October 31st for us, uh, you know, we usually call it Halloween, but very serious Protestants call it Reformation Day. Uh, and so just a few years ago when you had uh, 2017 was the 500 year anniversary of that, um, of the Reformation of that day. Uh, a lot of celebration happened in the Protestant world. So what, what was that day important for? What Luther supposedly, a legend holds it, uh, did is he went to the door of the Wittenberg church, the Schlosskirche, and he hammered his famous 95 theses on the door of the church. Um, this is, I think, greatly misunderstood. The, the, the misunderstanding is that Luther uh, was sort of shaking his fist at the, at the Catholic Church. He wants to break away from the Catholic Church. He hates the Catholic Church at this point, uh, and he wants to start the Reformation. That is absolutely not true. In those first years, uh, Lu after 1517, Luther saw himself as a faithful son of the Church, that what he was doing was a sort of service to the Church. Um, and he was sort of baffled that people were calling him out for, for heresy or being an unfaithful son of the Church. And he certainly wasn't initially trying to break away from the Catholic Church. One of the things that we can, we know this is because those 95 theses were written in Latin. If you want to start a sort of popular movement to break away half of Europe to, um, to, to, to start this new movement, um, even though it actually ended up happening, it's probably not a good idea to think, oh, I'm going to start this reformation by, by um, writing these 95 theses in Latin because almost nobody knew Latin at the time. So why did Luther do that? Well, Luther was basically posting what we would say uh, today kind of on a, on, a, on, a, on a board outside of a, uh, of a, of a school um, because the, the university was just a few blocks away. And he was inviting his fellow professors to have an academic debate. Right? That's what academics do. There's a, there's a particular challenge, a particular idea to be wrestled with. Academics get together and they debate that. So that's initially what Luther had in mind. Now, those 95 theses were quickly translated into German and other local languages, and it did uh, uh, spread quite quickly. Uh, one of the things that Luther had the advantage of that other reformers, such as John Wycliffe, uh, the, the, British, the, the English reformer, 
uh, didn't have uh, earlier was the printing press. There's a lot of scholarship that's been done on how the Reformation was able to be successful because of the printing press, which was invented in the mid 15th century. So we're only talking about 70 years after the invention of the printing press that Luther is, is writing these 95 theses. Uh, so yes, we can say October 31st, 1517 is the sort of start date if that's what we want, but that's certainly not what Luther had in mind. We're going to talk here in a little bit about some of these indulgences, uh, sorry, these, these theses that include uh, something about uh, uh, Luther's problem with indulgences. But I want to first talk about what these indulgences are, because these are also greatly misunderstood. For one, one thing, people, even Catholics, think that indulgences don't exist in the Catholic Church anymore, that the sort of Reformation washed those away. But indulgences, in fact, still do exist in the Catholic Church. Um, what it had happened in the early 16th century is that there was a, a Dominican named Johannes Tetzel who was sort of going around uh, um, raising money, and he wasn't the only one, uh, raising money to build St. Peter's Basilica. And basically what was happening was an abuse of indulgences, right? And there's one thing we always need to keep clear in our minds, the thing itself and the abuse of the thing, right? Uh, and there are lots of things that in themselves are good, but then they can be abused and are abused. And we should rightly uh, uh, reject those abuses. And Johannes Tetzel, in fact, was later uh, sort of punished for his abuses. So there was admittedly abuses going on with indulgences, basically selling indulgences uh, to make money for St. Peter's Basilica or, or some other reason. But the indulgences themselves uh, are not fundamentally problematic. So Tetzel was going around uh, sort of basically selling these, these indulgences and Luther and others got wind of it. And sort of this is what prompted the 95 Theses, uh, and, uh, although the 95 Theses aren't exclusively about indulgences. <sighs> indulgences are a remission by the church of temporal penalty due to sin. The first one was done by Pope Urban II in 1095. Um, so one way to think about it is like this. Let's say you you know you're you you are driving 100 miles down the speed down the highway. You get pulled over by the cop. So you broke the law. You shouldn't have done it. And now you have to be punished. Well, there's different ways that the judge could punish you. Uh, he could send you to jail if he wants to, or he could uh, charge you a fine. And you know because speeding is not that serious of a crime, he's probably not going to throw you in jail. He's probably going to charge you a fine. Now, none of us would say paying that fine is buying your way out of jail. Uh, now, if you were to sort of pay off the judge, that would be something different, right? That would be an abuse of the legal systems. You shouldn't be paying off judges. But we would never say, um, paying a fine is buying your way out of jail. So what an indulgence is, 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 is it, it's not a replacement of the sacrament of reconciliation. Um, that in theory, uh, you know, you still have to go to that sacrament of reconciliation, confess your sins, have the intent, have contrite heart. You have to be given for your sins. And then the priest will give you some sort of uh, penance. Usually, you know, these days it's something pretty uh, limp, like go say fi five Hail Marys or, or five Our Fathers or something like that, which is pretty easy to do. Um, and so the indulgence, though, technically uh, can satisfy that part. It does, again, it doesn't satisfy the entire sacrament of reconciliation. Just that penance part, that last part. So instead of saying five Hail Marys, you can donate some money to the church, for example. Uh, again, that's, that's not an abuse in itself, though it did get abused by people like Tetzel and others. So Luther hears about this, uh, not just the abuse, but he wants to call into question, um, or at least debate, indulgences themselves. And of course, Protestants, uh, you know, jumping ahead a little bit, Protestants do ultimately reject uh, indulgences. There's no, this is one thing you'll, you won't find in any Protestant church. They, none of them have indulgences. In fact, almost none of them have what we would call a sacrament of reconciliation. The Church of England here in the United States, we call it the Episcopalian Church, is, is the closest Protestant church to us. And so they do have 
um, I don't, I don't even know if they call it the sacrament of reconciliation, but, but confession, right? They have that, but pretty much all other churches, um, in the Protestant world don't have that. And, and they certainly don't have indulgences. Let's go ahead and go through just a few of these 95 theses. You should be reading them uh, this week, and maybe we'll have time to talk about them in class. Um, we're not, not going to go through all of these, but just a few of them. So let's first, just on that first page, talk about um, sort of, I guess we can call it the preamble. Out of love for the truth, uh, Luther says, and, and I think that's important, and we should take that seriously. Luther is pursuing truth. He's not just you know, doing what Henry VIII did. Out of the love for truth and desire to bring it to light, the following propositions will be discussed at Wittenberg under the presidency of the Reverend Father Martin Luther, Master of Arts and Sacred Theology, and lecture in ordinary on the same at that place. Wherefore, he requests that those who are unable to be present and debate orally with us may do so by letter. Notice, debate orally. Right? That's what professors do. We get together and we, we debate stuff. That's what we love to do. Um, so notice nowhere in there does he say a call to arms to break away from the Catholic Church. Okay, Let's just read the, the first one. Our Lord and Master Jesus Christ, when he said, Poententiam agite, will that the whole life of believers should be repentance. Right. So that Latin phrase there, repent, do penance. So in other words, he's saying penance should, our entire lives should be about penance because we're sinners. Um, so again, this idea of uh, not restricting penance to a specific sacrament or, or certainly to the practice of indulgences. And, and next week, we're going to talk about how Lutherans and others uh, talk, think or talk about sacraments, right? We Catholics have seven sacraments and, and, and Protestants don't. So we'll get into that next week. Uh, let's let's jump ahead just a, a couple more here. Number twenty seven. Number twenty seven. They preach uh, man who say that soon as the penny jingles into the money box, the soul flies out of purgatory. Right. So what's that a reference to? That's hinting at Johannes Tetzel. This idea of when when Tetzel and others are going around trying to sell indulgences in order to make money for St. Peter's Basilica, the construction of it, they have these sort of uh, you know slogans or what we might call memes or or um, or uh, clickbait, right? And so as as soon as the penny jingles into the money box, the soul flies out. That was the abuse that Tetzel and others are going around saying that. And so that would convince people of, oh, my mother, my father, my grandfather, these people are dead. They're in purgatory. And if I uh, uh, donate this money, that as soon as the money, the, the coin hits the bottom of the box, grandpa's soul is liberated from purgatory and goes to heaven. And if that, and if you're illiterate, if you're a farmer, if you don't have any theological sophistication, and yet this Dominican is telling you that, well, why wouldn't you do that? You love your grandpa. You want to get grandpa out of purgatory. Uh, and so if that's what's being presented to you, then why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you make great sacrifices for your grandpa? You would hope your grandchildren would do that for you. Um, so again, there's that abuse. And rightly, in, in this one in particular, 27, is uh, uh, rightly calling out Tetzel and others for that abuse of indulgences. Uh, number 28. It is certain that when the penny jingles into the money box, gain and avarice can be increased, but the result of the intercession of the church is in the power of God alone, right? Luther rightly pointing to the dangers of when money and religion start getting intertwined, right? When it's not simply, I want to donate money to the church because I think that's a good thing to do, but I want to do, do, donate money to the Catholic Church because I think I'm getting something out of this or Grandpa's getting something out of it. Then it becomes sort of selfish, greedy motivation. And of course, as the old saying goes, he who uh, pays the piper calls the tune. So when you have these really rich benefactors donating money, what are the ways that they're able to manipulate priests or bishops or, or popes, right? And we know that happened throughout the, the history of the papacy, especially in the medieval uh, world, um, and, and we don't have time to get into that. That's certainly interesting, um, and, and I don't, I don't want to give the impression that we're not talking about the abuses of the medieval popes because I'm 
um, too scared to talk about that because it's it's shameful. It is shameful. We're just not talking about it because this is a pastoral ministry program, and we need to focus on the things that are important for pastoral ministry. So there's just a few uh, of, of, of Luther's important indulge, uh, 95 theses and, and what he's talking about penance and indulgences and the abuse of those. So as I said, uh, even though Luther was simply intending to have an oral debate with his fellow professors, wrote in Latin, that this quickly gets translated into uh, German and other languages, spreads like wildfire because of the printing press, and Luther starts to get some notoriety, starts to get some heat on him, um, and initially is quite perplexed by all of this. But in the coming years, um, you know, Luther sort of uh, digs his feet in and not only talks about indulgences, the abuse of indulgences, but starts to spread his criticism of of uh, the Catholic Church and his teaching. And as you'll see next week, this idea of indulgences, even though it kind of uh, launched the Reformation, in many ways quickly became, not irrelevant, but became secondary or even tertiary. That this, this is not the fundamental set of issues that Luther and the other reformers were revolting against. That becomes things like the authority of the Pope, um, the idea of grace and free will, the idea of of uh, the role of the Bible in the life of the Christian. So all these other things become quickly more important. Um, so between October 31st, 1517 and, and June of 1520, so we're talking not quite three years, things happen. Luther starts writing other texts, gets himself into trouble. And the Pope issued, uh, this is Pope Leo X, uh, issued a, a bull, a sort of uh, proclamation, exurge domine, which sort of means get up, Lord, right? You know, um, there, there is this danger in the field, Lord, get up and, and, and um, uh, exterminate this, this, this danger to the church. And it condemns 41 propositions of Luther as heretical and ordered all of his books to be burned, uh, and gave Luther two, mo two months to recant, right? So there is, even in this beginning time, the option or the opportunity for Luther to sort of backpedal and, and uh, confess his sins and, and, and recant what he was teaching. Um, but he doesn't do that. In fact, in January 1521, uh, well, I should back up in, in, in December of uh, 1520, outside the walls of Wittenberg, he has this um, uh, bonfire and he burns the, the papal bull. He burns books of canon law and scholastic theology and, and, and all kinds of things, again, that he thinks are corruptions, right? There's no reference in the New Testament, for example, of anything called canon law. So Luther looks at that and sort of says, well, that's a that's a that's a barnacle on the hull of the ship. We need to get rid of that. Um, and and I've I've been to I've been to uh, Wittenberg and, and they have sort of a plaque uh, right outside the city walls where you can see uh, where Luther did this burning, and then so in January 1521, Luther uh, because he didn't recant during that time, um, uh, that two month period that he was given. Uh, was excommunicated. So maybe this is uh, a better uh, date than October 31st, 1517, as sort of the launch of the Reformation. Although next week we'll even talk about a better date, I think, uh, uh, 1555. So we'll talk about uh, um, the, the Peace of Augsburg next time. So what ends up happening is that Luther, uh, again, now, he, now he's excommunicated, and of course that means not simply uh, excommunicated from the church. Then you get the sort of state involved, and Luther becomes a sort of uh, uh, hunted man. He's invited by uh, uh, Char uh, King Charles um, V, the, the, uh, uh, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, which as the joke goes was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Um, at the time, he was about 20 years old, and he was called to something, which if you just read it, uh, it looks like it says Diet of Worms, but it's, it's German, so it's pronounced Diet of Worms. Diet is kind of a German word for council, and Worms is a town which still exists in sort of southwestern Germany. Uh, I've been there too. There's a statue of, of Luther uh, in, in Worms. 
So this is another thing that I think is is misunderstood. That the assumption is that this was Charles V. So now a political leader, not a religious leader, a young twenty year old emperor calling Luther to sort of recant and 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 uh, become a, a a good faithful son of the church again. But in fact, the Diet of Worms sort of included um, this famous story of Luther, but it was not restricted to that, right? that Charles was dealing with all kinds of different uh, political problems that any emperor deals with at that. And that this event this uh, with Luther uh, was just one of many different things that the emperor had to deal with uh, at that Diet of Worms. So, so Luther is called to uh, sort of recant once again, uh, just as the pope had done. And the, 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 as, this, as the legend goes, these stories are, uh, the, 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 the books that Luther um, had a, apparently written were put on the table in front of him. And he's asked, you know, are these the books that you wrote? And he says, yes. And then he's asked to recant. And to the surprise of many, he actually says, you know, actually, I need, I need some time to think about that, which is probably prudent, right? Uh, Luther's, Luther's often known as a fiery figure, an impulsive figure, an angry figure. Uh, but here I think he's actually doing something uh, prudent, right? That you should never um, uh, quickly uh, do something uh, as, as hasty as just sort of um, condemning everything that you've ever written. So he, call, he asks for some time to think about this, and he's given a, a day. So the next day Luther comes back. Uh, in front of the emperor, and the legend says uh, that he he refused to recant or deny the books that he had written, and the famous phrase is, here I stand, I can do no other, although there's probably, uh, he probably didn't actually say that, but it, even if he didn't say those words, that basically was his attitude, right, and he refused to recant. Um, so the Diet of Worms ends, Luther then has to head back to Saxony, which he was, part of the reason why he was able to be successful and, and never was executed um, or arrested or anything like that is because he had the protection of uh, the elector Frederick of Saxony, the sort of prince of Saxony. That's where Luther was from. Uh, and so he, when he goes back and, and eventually makes it back to Wittenberg, he never leaves Saxony ever again because he knows that if he does, he could very well be captured and, and executed because if he leaves Saxony, he doesn't have the protection of Frederick. So on the way back to Wittenberg from Worms, which is not in Saxony, um, he, gets, he gets kidnapped. And he disappears for about 10 months. And the assumption is he's dead, that the pope or the, you know, the pope's men or somebody else had captured him and sort of executed him in private. But that's actually not what happened. Uh, he gets captured by his own men. He gets captured by the men of, um, of Frederick. And he gets taken to uh, the Wartburg Castle, which is still there today. I've been there. Um, and he is in a sort of seclusion for about 10 months. He grows this long beard. He takes an alias, Junker Jorg, uh, you know, so he, he doesn't, uh, isn't known by Luther. It's kind of up on this hill in the middle of the forest. Uh, to this day, it's still on this hill in the middle of this forest. And so he would take these sort of long rambling um, walks at night. Uh, he was quite lonely. And I think quite bored. And one of the things that he does while he's in the Vortberg Castle that becomes famous is that he translates the Bible into German. <clears throat> now, there is this impression, a false impression, that the Catholic Church in the medieval period sort of jealously guarded the Bible, wouldn't allow the Bible to be translated into any local languages, uh, and only reserved it for certain people. That's not entirely accurate. First of all, we already talked about just in general, the literacy rate late, literacy rate was low. So even if they did translate it into local languages, most people couldn't read it anyways. They couldn't read Latin, they couldn't read their local language, German or French or whatever the language is. Second of all, there were um, uh, uh, Bibles that had been translated into English, for example, in England. So 
it's not fair or correct to say that no Bibles had ever been translated for a thousand years from Latin into a local language. That, that is not true. There, there were. But we also have to admit um, that when Luther translated the Bible into German, and because of the printing press, we're back to the printing press again, that that did radically change things. That it allowed, the uh, not only did people start to be able uh, to read because of the printing press, um, but it, the Bible became more accessible to people because of the printing press. Luther translated into German. So those who couldn't read Latin but could read German uh, were, were able to have access to it. So even though I think that perception of uh, you know, the Catholic Church jealously guarding the Bible in the medieval period is not entirely accurate. At the same time, we do have to recognize that when Luther translated the Bible into German, that did radically change things along with the printing press. Luther did eventually, after 10 months, leave this isolation in Vorper Castle against the, the, the advice of a lot of people. Uh, but he couldn't uh, sort of stay there indefinitely. I think, again, part of it, I think, is just bored. His personality, I don't think he's not the sort of type to go off into seclusion. Uh, but also that, that what he had started by this point was starting to... Um, uh, uh, shake the foundations of Christianity in Europe. And people is, because people had assumed that Luther was dead, other people, uh, other reformers, some who uh, agreed and believed exactly in Luther's theology, but other people who didn't and, and other Protestants who were teaching and preaching other things against the Catholic Church and other, other things against Lutheran theology were starting to rise. And um, not only are you having sort of a revolt against the Catholic Church, now you're also having a revolt against um, uh, a sort of peasant revolts revolting against uh, civil authorities. And that was causing violence and damage to property, damage to you know uh, agricultural fields. Uh, food, what we would call uh, uh, food uh, supply chains and that type of thing. Uh, and it, one might expect, as often many people have, that Luther would come out of Vordberg Castle and sort of side with the peasants and sort of this revolt against authority because that's what he was doing, right? He was revolting against the Catholic Church's authority. But in fact, that's not what he did. He, he cited against the peasants. He thought of them as sort of rabble rousers, uh, sowing discord in society, and he called for the princes to to put down the peasants uh, and and restore order, uh, and that surprised a lot of people. So he comes out of hiding, and people are shocked. He's he's still alive. As I said, Luther uh, never leaves Saxony ever again because he can't, else he'll be captured. So he stays in Saxony for the rest of his life. Uh, he is quite a prolific writer. Uh, becomes foundational for the um, uh, for 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 the change of Christianity. He dies in 1546, and that's an important date because we'll see um, next time that the uh, uh, the the Council of Trent starts in 1545. And it ends in 1563. So the, the Council of Trent had started even while Luther is alive, but uh, it ends after Luther is already dead. He gets uh, married. Luther gets married at the age of 42 to a, man, a woman named Catherine von Bora. She was 26. The age difference wasn't that big of a deal back then. Uh, she, Just as he had been a former monk, a priest, she had been a former nun. Uh, and she and others... Um, uh, uh, priests and monks and nuns broke away from the Catholic Church and specifically their monastic vows. Uh, in most of Protestantism, including Lutheranism, there's no such thing as, as priests, uh, excuse me, um, well, there's no priests, but there's no monks, there's no nuns. Luther wrote a treatise against vows because, of course, monks and nuns take vows of, of, of permanent, permanent vows of, of chastity and obedience, for example. Um, and so Luther wrote against that. And in, uh, so just as he abandoned the priesthood and the Augustinian order, Catherine von Bora abandoned her life as a nun. They ended up getting married. And in fact, um, basically the entire Augustinian monastery, which is still in Wittenberg today, uh, you can go and see it. I've been there. 
um, was emptied out because of Luther's thought. And so that monastery was given as a gift, a wedding present by Frederick to Luther and, and Catherine. Um, so Luther lived uh, until 1546. He dies at the age of 63. Uh, and, and they had several uh, children. Finally, I just want to say a few words about fundamental Lutheran uh, theological principles, and, and these are different from Catholic principles. We're going to get more into detail in the next video uh, about the differences between Catholics and Protestants, um, but here we just want to talk specifically about Lutheran thought. Um, so one point uh, is this: the three solas. The word sola is uh, Latin. It just means alone. And so in Lutheran thought, you have three solas. Sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia. Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone. So scripture alone, meaning that the, that the scripture is the fundamental uh, authority of the Christian life. So what that means is not bishops, not popes, not priests, uh, not councils, none of that stuff, right? So Protestants uh, don't have ecumenical councils the way uh, Catholics do. So the authority of the, of, the, of the Christian life is the Bible. Uh, the second is sola fide, faith alone. This gets back into the thorny question that had been going on since uh, the Pelagian controversy in the 5th century, that, that thorny theological question of what's the relationship between faith and works, right? Believing in Christ and his um, sacrifice on the cross for us and the works that we do in this life. Do they have any sort of uh, efficacy in our salvation? Luther says, no, that we are saved sola fide, sola gratia. So grace alone, faith alone. We are saved by grace through faith. In other words, that the faith that we have in that grace of Christ on the cross saving us um, uh, from our sins, that's how we're saved, that, that what we do is irrelevant uh, to uh, efficaciously towards, towards our salvation. There's also a sort of shift in, again, because you have the authority of, of the Christian is alone in the uh, Bible. Well, you don't need popes, you don't need uh, priests. So you have a shift from the sort of the hierarchical structures uh, that, that power, if you want to put it in that crude language, uh, should be placed in the hands of every Christian. So one thing that this means is it, it pretty much, again, different Christian groups, Protestant groups believe different things. But for a lot of Protestants, um, you know, any baptized Christian can baptize any other Christian. In the Catholic Church, of course, the, 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 the rule is that uh, priests or bishops baptize uh, and just the average lay layman uh, or lay woman cannot baptize unless there's extreme cases like um, you know, somebody's dying in a hospital, then there are, there's exceptions, but the, 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 the rule is that that happens by clerics. We already talked about monks and nuns being freed from their vows, rejection of the, the sort of uh, uh, selling of indulgences, and in fact, indulgences themselves. Education, this is uh, something actually I think we should thank the Protestants for. Um, you know, in the United States, we have over 90% literacy rate. And in a lot of other countries, Cuba uh, has a 100% literacy rate. Um, where do these high literacy rates come from? Well, they start in the, in the 16th century of the Protestant Reformation. Because if you're a Protestant and you say that the, the authority of the Christian is uh, the scripture, well, you better be able to know how to read scripture. Uh, so you need to learn your local language. Uh, um, uh, 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 German in his case. The Bible is written in Hebrew and Greek. So you have a sort of flourishing in biblical scholarship over the next few centuries in the original languages. Uh, and of course, Latin as well. Um, so you got to be able to read. So a lot of modern education uh, can actually, uh, and literacy rates, education rates can be traced, thankfully, back to, uh, to, to the Protestant Reformation. Um, there are no priests uh, in the sense of ordained men, certainly not ordained women. Um, 
that you have what might be called pastors or ministers. These might be people who are certainly higher ed, uh, more, more educated than the average Protestant. Maybe they go to a seminary or school or, or they have a, a particular charisma in order uh, to preach well, for example. Um, and a lot of Protestants do allow uh, women to be uh, in roles of, of teaching and preaching. Uh, certainly not all Protestants, but, but that... Um, uh, that is the case for some that any they reject the mass um, but they of course have their own liturgies some of them are very similar to the mass others are very different but what's important is not how similar or different is but that they said that those services should be done in the local language in vernacular whereas the catholic church responded against that and said no no, no the mass must be celebrated in latin and and people who were uh, younger than uh, born in the 1960s are often surprised to find out that the Catholic Church continued to celebrate Mass uh, around the world in Latin uh, up until the 1960s. And when um, the vernacular was allowed to be Mass was allowed to be celebrated in the vernacular, a lot of Catholics uh, were thankful for that because of course they didn't know Latin and so the mass was completely nonsensical to them but a lot of other Catholics were not happy because they said well we sort of sold out and become Protestant that we're we're doing what Protestants have been doing for hundreds of years um, so there to this day is a sort of d a debate about that uh, finally um, at least the last point for us to talk about today is the idea that any doctrine that you can't find explicitly in the Bible should be removed. This is getting back to my very first point that um, the idea is reforming the church, getting the church back to what the church was in the beginning and getting rid of all of these things, these additions that have corrupted the church over the, the 1500 year period. Um, so anything that's not explicitly mentioned in the Bible, uh, because again, the Bible is the, the sole authority of the church, get rid of them, get rid of all of them. So uh, for example, there is no explicit reference to um, uh, the, the sacrament of reconciliation. Now there are obvious references to, you know, confessing your sins. Um, and, and, and Protestants will do that to God. They'll certainly, you know, if I've sinned, I will pray to God and, and confess my sins to that. But as a sort of formal sacrament of reconciliation that we Catholics have, Protestants look at the Bible and say, well, that's not in there, so let's get rid of it. Um, we'll talk more about this next time as to why, the, why Catholics say, well, yes, you're right. The sacrament of reconciliation is not explicitly mentioned in the Bible as a formal sacrament, but we're not going to get rid of it. So we'll come back to that next week. So think uh, of, of this unit. We're sort of halfway done now. We got the first half of the Protestant uh, res um, uh, rejection of all these Catholic things we've been talking about. Uh, and then next week we will come back and we'll see how do Catholics respond to that, uh, specifically in the Council of Trent. Again, Catholics hold that councils are authoritative, whereas Protestants say, well, it's, it's not the Bible, so councils are not authoritative. And then next time we'll go a little bit more deeply into what are some of the, not just the differences between Protestants and Catholics, uh, but where those differences come from. Why do the Protestants reject certain things of, of Catholic teaching? And finally, we come once again to that question that we always need to ask ourselves is, okay, we've learned about Luther, we've learned about certain fundamental uh, Protestant thoughts. We'll talk more about that next week. How does this affect me as a lay pastoral minister in my situation, in my context, in my parish? How do I reach out to those uh, people in RCIA to help them understand better what Catholics believe? How do I, in my cubicle at work, I've got a Lutheran sitting next to me in my cubicle, and we have lunch together every Friday, and, and, and how do I speak to a Lutheran um, uh, on, in his assumptions or her assumptions and be able to articulate what it is that we believe? So bringing this history and this theology that we've been talking about back to that pastoral. So I invite you to think about that question, uh, as you should always uh, be thinking about that pastoral question. This is now, what, our fifth video? 
Um, so I shouldn't, uh, at this point in the semester, you should already be automatically thinking that question. I shouldn't have to remind you, although I certainly will. And in our class discussion on Zoom, uh, we will certainly have uh, time to talk about this. What are the implications in your life as a pastoral minister as to how to apply what you know now uh, about uh, Luther and the Protestants into the life of ministry?